All right, next I'd like to welcome Tao Z. He's going to talk about um, mining open source code. Okay. Thanks, John. Uh, now I'm going to talk about our recent research on uh, searching and mining open source code from the web. Uh, this is joint work with uh, my student, graduate student from North Carolina State University. Let me first give you some motivation uh, of our research. So uh, to reduce um, software development costs and many programmers um, are reusing some APIs provided by some library or frameworks. Um, while enjoying the benefits of the, um, reducing the development efforts at the same time, they face the complexity and the lack of a documentation of these frameworks or libraries. They, Therefore, they spend a lot of time in like uh, browsing their documentation if they have any, or the source code implementation to figure out how to use the APIs provided by these frameworks or libraries. And some, in some situations, they might even like have defects in the code that they wrote um, of using um, the APIs of these existing libraries and frameworks. The basic idea to address these issues is to look at these existing API client codes available uh, from the web, and then discover the common patterns as kind of a guidelines for the programmers to write new API client code to reuse these APIs, or to de detect the defects that uh, may potentially exist in the API client code written by the programmers. Uh, to summarize the key ideas in one slide, it's kind of a relatively simple. Basically, given a particular code entity, for example, a class or a particular public method or API method provided by the class. And then we formulate a query with the name of this um, API method, for example. And then we issue this query to an existing code search engine, such as Google Code Search. And then we collect uh, a relatively large number of the code examples that might include the core size of this particular API method. Then we do some analysis to collect the basic facts about this API usage from these code examples. And finally, we apply some data mining techniques to discover the common patterns that uh, may exist among these code examples of using this particular API of inches. If we are focused on code reuse or helping people to write API client code more efficiently, then we can recommend the common patterns together with associated code examples to the programmers. If we focus on the task of defect detection, then we can detect the violations of the mind patterns of the API usage as the potential defect for the programmers to look at. Uh, actually, uh, in recent years, there have been a lot of work on applying data mining on um, software engineering data, for example, those uh, data um, in the software development environment. One problem with existing data mining, uh, mining software engineering data work or especially on applying data mining on source code, is that they may not have enough relevant, uh, important data points for you to discover this kind of common API patterns that I earlier mentioned. You may apply the data mining techniques on a very huge code base like Linux or, or Eclipse in Java, but for a particular API of interest, the usage the locations of using these APIs might not exist on even very large code base. So that's a key issue for data mining, as you may know. Um, having sufficient relevant data points is very important for you to get good results out of data mining. So in our new research, we kind of exploit the power of the existing code search engine to expand the mining scope to the whole open source world, basically. Uh, depending on how the underlying code search engine can deal with uh, the different kind of uh, uh, code repository available on the web. 
Then after we gather the results, and then we can apply uh, some mining techniques on the gathered co-examples from the web. And then we discover the patterns, as I mentioned. We can use uh, these discovered patterns in code reuse or in defect detection. In particular, our approach um, are centered around the searching infrastructure, which basically is based on the existing code search engine, such as uh, Google Code Search. And then, based on the information we gather and we apply different mining techniques or, together with different uh, program analysis techniques, uh, we can help us to write API client code to implement certain programming tasks. Uh, we implement a tool called uh, Password for Java programs. We also um, apply these kind of techniques in finding defects in applications. Uh, for example, we develop a tool called NegWeb in finding those negative conditions in the code that you have written in reusing certain API. For example, you might forget about checking the arguments values or checking the return values of certain API when you try to reuse certain API. Uh, we also develop a tool called XWeb, which um, is used to detect some defects related to exception handling. Basically, for example, if you, uh, you are reading certain database content and you have encountered certain exceptions, then when after you encounter the exception, you need to close the database or, or some other resources that early on you open. So these kind of defects have, are very common in practice. Um, uh, later on, I will show some of our results on detecting these kind of defects in open source world. Now, let me first focus on the, the central part of our approach, the searching infrastructure, which is based on existing code search engines. There are several uh, kind of well-known code search engines available uh, in the internet. Uh, they can index million lines of open source code available from the web, or even billion lines of code such as uh, Google Code Search. Uh, some other example code search engines like uh, Codebase, Codas.com, Kruger.com. Um, basically, for many um, of these existing code search engines, they can search these open source projects hosted on some well-known open source repository, uh, such as uh, SourceForge.net and, and some other open source uh, websites. And um, Google Code Search can even like uh, using its underlying like searching techniques to crawl and index a public available uh, code repository that you actually like you put on your website. I mean, it, the code uh, repository might not be within SourceForge, but if you put on your website, Google Code Search can uh, can search and index the, the the code examples inside the. The, the code repository you put on. Um, as I mentioned earlier, when you have certain API, you want to see like whether there are some uh, existing code example that might be relevant to your programming task, then you issue some query with the name of the API and uh, give this query to the existing code search engine. But not every returns code example might be relevant to you. Uh, I would give you some examples on uh, some scenarios of searching uh, Google Code Search, and uh, the, code, the next one is on the krugos.com. This is a very example. You just try to see, okay, whether you can find some existing code example related to uh, using fopen, which is a kind of well-known API. Um, Many code search engines can allow you to specify the language of the, the code you want to search. Uh, for example, for Google Code Search, you can specify in your query like the language is C, and you want to search F open. And then you can get like a very large number of results, and we basically manually look at the top 20 to see how many of, of these are actually uh, using F open function in the code. Uh, we found that only two out of 20. But um, this existing code search engine can provide more complicated interface for you to uh, refine or improve your queries in order to get more relevant examples. Um, here we can use another more complicated regular expression, basically saying that 
uh, it's uh, language C, the find the extension C, um, you have F open, and then here basically it's saying that you you have the the blankets uh, left and right hand side to match, which indicates like the match location would be likely to be a function call instead of just a variable name. So that can improve significantly uh, of the search results. Um, for Krugel.com, uh, we can also do some similar uh, search uh, with some queries. Like it, in the interface, it actually can allow you to have some menu to specify whether uh, you are searching in C. So, and then you enter F open in the query text box, and then you can get also a large number of the co-examples spec. Um, again, like just using this default searching keywords, you will have very few number of the examples in the top 20 examples written by Krugels uh, to be relevant. Uh, but Krugel.com has this kind of a, a configuration to allow you to search only the, like the function call, have that kind of an option to help you to improve your search. Then we select that particular feature, and then in the end, we also get very good results similar to uh, Google.com, uh, Google Code Search. Um, but still, there are some irrelevant co-examples, and here I just list some of the reasons for the irrelevant examples returned by these code search engines, uh, depending on whether you enable those advanced features uh, provided by different code search engines. Um, when you search F open, some function definition might include F open, not necessarily function call. Um, some variable name may include F open. Some code comments uh, might include F open, not necessarily the actual call size. And with that particular, uh, like a re very complicated regular expression earlier I show you, given to uh, Google code search, you will still match against the code comment. I mean, the, the particular F open, you put the F open and like put the left blanket and right blanket, you would still like match that. I mean, although you may not want that. Um, some code search engine might not be case sensitive. Uh, for example, you may have some code example invoking a particular uh, functions like F open, like with different uh, case. And then Krugel.com would just return this example, although it's not actually what you want. So depending on whether some code search engine provide this kind of feature of allowing to specify case sensitive uh, or not, uh, Google code search would provide this particular option, but not all the uh, code search engines would provide that. Now let's get back to like our infrastructure, which is basically based on this existing code search engine. The idea is I. Um, mentioned earlier, we try to um, formulate some queries, including the keyword of the class or the API methods. We want to search for examples. And then we issue the query to an existing code search engine. We gather the code examples and store these examples in our local code repositories. And later on, we will apply our program analysis and mining techniques on these uh, code examples. Um, one challenge we will face in contrast to traditional program analysis um, or on use in uh, mining software engineering data, the issue is that the code examples are partial. That's expected, right? When you search these code examples, this code search engine would normally return um, only a single file. But of course, some code search engine might have an option to allow you to download the whole package, the whole uh, source code uh, library or the repository. But that's too expensive when you have too many these uh, examples for you to deal with. So normally, the code examples are partial. So we need to have some uh, special kind of a partial code analysis to deal with this issue. Um, some of the techniques that we have uh, developed uh, in dealing with these with issues um, um, are in these slides. Basically, um, we will not start from the main method. Usually, when you have the whole code base, you would like start from the main method or main function and then construct the core graph, for example, from there. And now we download only one class, class by class. Then we 
consider each public method as an entry point for us to construct our core graph, for example, or control flow graph. Um, we do some uh, local inlining. What I mean by that is uh, when, when we download one file, for particular core size, it may call another method or function declare within that file. Then we automatically inline that method to put the code portion on, I mean, put in another method being called, being invoked to the location of the core size. Um, one very important issues we need to deal with is that there are some types uh, in the program that we downloaded from the, uh, from the code search engine returns examples uh, are unknown. Basically, for example, for certain variable, what's the type of the variable, you might not, not, might not know that because you don't have the whole code base for you to resolve the types. Then we use some type heuristics to deal with that. Uh, it's kind of like a reverse direction of the, the compiler. Um, I will give you some concrete example to give you some ideas of what we mean by these uh, heuristics. Um, for this particular statement, for example, in the code example we gather, and we may not know the return type of the create queue section because we don't have the declaration uh, or the implementation for this particular function or method uh, for the code that we downloaded. Then, but we still can like, infer some uh, information about the return type of this particular method. Um, basically, for this assignment, we know the return type of the create queue section would be exactly the type of queue on the left-hand side or a subtype of it. Okay? So then we can kind of use and uh, can deal with many of these situations where we don't have the uh, types uh, being known. Um, there are some other situations. Um, for example, we have this return statement, uh, return the return value of create queue sections. Again, we don't have the declaration or the implementation of this, this uh, create queue session. We don't know the return type. But we observe that the return type of the enclosing method is uh, queue section. Then we again we can infer that the return type of that particular method would be exactly the queue section type or a subtype of it. Okay. Uh, there's another technique. So I basically try to reuse information we can gather from different places in the code examples. For this example, like uh, we have n1's return type of the queue. Then for this n2, we don't know it's it's a receiver object type uh, just by looking at the code here. But early on, we can infer that the M1's return type is Q. Then we can infer, uh, or the subtype of Q again, uh, we can infer that the M2's receiver object type would be uh, Q or a subtype of Q. So these are the uh, heuristics that we, we use in dealing with this kind of partial code examples which would exist in this particular scenario of exploiting the code example gathered from code search engine. Later on, I will give you some example why these types are important in our particular applications. After we have this searching infrastructure, we download these files and we have some partial code analysis to gather the facts about this code example. Then we can do some useful things for us. Uh, the first application is uh, called password, basically help us to write code, uh, in write client code of a particular API method. In particular, the problem we try to address is that during some programming uh, tasks, I mean, trying to deal with certain programming tasks, you may know what object you have at that point before you actually write a new code. That's kind of a relatively easy for you to understand. Like, when you're trying to fill in the method body of a particular method, you know you have the object of the argument type, right? Or you have the objects of the object fields of the class that you try to fill in the code. So these are the object types that you have. But as sometimes you may know the target object you want to produce, but you don't know how to write the code sequence, the method call sequence in between from what the objects you have 
to the target object that you want. Uh, I will give you one example here. One particular task it, in like Eclipse programming is to uh, pass the code in a dirty editor, which includes the code that uh, haven't been saved. We can translate this particular task into a query, like we know we have the type of uh, an object of the I edited part. Um, in order to pass a code for, by using different techniques, for example, you search the documentation or you kind of browse different classes provided by the framework, you know you need a particular object of I compilation unit. But you don't know how to write the code in between from this particular object I editor part you have to this I compilation unit. Here are other example solution that the password can suggest to you when you issue this query in the form that I put up on the slides. So basically, you have the object of I edit I editor part, right? It can come from your arg argument of the method that you are trying to fill the method body, or if from somewhere you invoke some other methods. And the password would suggest that first you get have this I editor part object. You need to invoke get editor input to get an I editor input object, and then you need to invoke a static method uh, declare in Java UI. Uh, which is get working copy manager and get another object uh, of the type I working copy manager. And finally, you invoke this get working copy method declare on this I working copy manager object. And with the argument of the editor, of the I editor input object early on you got. And finally, you got the I compilation unit uh, object. Then you accomplish your task of getting this object. Um, as you can see, it's really not trivial for a programmer who uh, is not familiar with these complex frameworks, I mean, which are often the case. And um, in, the, in the, like, the real world, for example, the Eclipse framework or some other frameworks that you are familiar with. Um, for this particular example, you can see we even need a particular instance of uh, um, I working copy managers in the middle in order to achieve our goal. And this particular um, object actually is not quite related to what Orange we have. So that's very difficult for us to guess. Right? We really need this object. And in addition, it also need to invoke a static method um, of Java UI class to get that particular instance. Okay? Um, this particular static method is not quite related to what we earlier have, like I did editor part. It's kind of a difficult for you to come up with this particular uh, step as well. So uh, let me just give you kind of a visual effects on like how it would work. So basically, you have the uh, I did part um, there. You may try to like uh, get this parser object, but you don't know what to fill in in the middle of this code segment. And then we issue a query like from I edit the part and I compilation unit to our password tool in the Eclipse plugin uh, environment. And then we issue some query to underlying code search engines such as Google Code Search. We gather a bunch of these code examples from the code search engine. And then we extract MIS, which basically represents a method invocation sequences leading us from the tag, the original I editor part to the I compilation object, uh, a unit object. And then we kind of apply some uh, simple statistical analysis to find out the frequent message call sequences um, for leading from I editor part object to the I compilation unit. And then in the end, we recommend the most frequent ones to the programmers. So that's basically the target sequence that the programmer can fill in uh, and to uh, accomplish the task that the programmer has. Um, inside the password infrastructure, it, um, it has, has several steps. For, as I mentioned earlier, you have the query, and then we download, we issue the query to the code search engine, and then we download the, the code examples returned by code engine, and we store in the local repository, and we do some partial code analysis 
to collect the master invocation sequences. After we get the sequences, we also do some post-processing. The reason is that for these sequences, there's still quite many. I mean, even we, we uh, try to narrow it down by focusing on the frequent master sequences. Then we use some uh, clustering techniques by grouping those similar message sequences together. For example, for two message sequences, if they kind of have one or two messages kind of being different in the middle, I mean, we consider they are similar enough so that we group them together to reduce the inspection efforts of programmers. And of course, we also use some ranking heuristics to help us to recommend uh, most likely useful uh, sequences to the, uh, to the programmers. Next, I would like to focus on a very interesting problem and, and the corresponding solution that we developed uh, in this particular situation. Uh, this situation um, is because, uh, as you can remember, like uh, for the sequences we want, like we want to find out a particular message sequence, start from the, uh, the existing object type, right? And involve a bunch of message and then reach the point where we have the target or destination object type. What if this particular meta sequence cut across two source files? It's possible, right? You have another method declared in another source file. Eventually, I mean, overall, putting together, you have the complete sequences. But using code search engine, we can gather the source file, including both the source object type and the destination object type in the same file. So that, forced, uh, that caused some issues for us. For some of the queries in our experience and evaluation, we couldn't find any co-examples by using this together, these two, uh, two types uh, issue to uh, code search engine. We propose a solution which uh, is quite uh, effective in dealing with the situation. The idea is that uh, instead of just putting this source object type and destination object type to the code search engine, we basically split this particular uh, query into <coughs> multiple ones. And then in the end, we compose the results from these multiple queries. Here, uh, as one, here is one example um, to show how these techniques would work. This is a real query that we encounter in our uh, evaluation. So here basically saying that um, currently, we have the I structure selection uh, object type, and we want to reach certain point have the input stream uh, object type. So as you can imagine, it's kind of like reach certain point we can read in something, right? Uh, but how we can get from the I structure selection to that object? And we can use password, right? We just formulate a query as uh, like this source object type and the destination object type but we get nothing from Google code search because we couldn't find a particular source file including these both uh, types in the, a single source file. Then next, we can basically start from the destination type. We issue only this query to a code search engine. Then basically, we look at like what are the object types commonly um, are used to reach these destination object types, okay? And then we find out um, like input stream, byte array input stream, five input streams can lead to this object input stream. After we get this most frequent three, one, uh, three um, object type, we issue for each of these intermediate object type, we issue another query starting from the source, which basically is the I structure selection. Then we are lucky at this point. Actually, we get like for three of these intermediate object type, we actually, for two of them, we get non-zero example spec. Then in the end, we basically can assemble the code sequences with this part and this part, okay? Then we get the result. So these are, uh, this is an interesting like, technique for us to use to deal with this kind of a situation of uh, relying on a code search engine to expand our scope, but at the same time, we may suffer from some issues and we use some new technique to deal with that. Here, I would like to just give you some very uh, brief 
um, overview of the experience and the evaluation we had. Uh, for more details in, uh, information, you can refer to our ASC 2007 uh, paper. And here basically is some uh, example questions from the developer forum. Uh, as you, you can imagine, I mean, when you try to uh, address certain difficult tasks, you just ask questions in the forum to, for some other experts to, uh, to help you. Uh, this particular problem is that how to deassemble Java bytecode. Uh, this is a particular task that you can achieve by using some bytecode engineering library like this one, BCEL. And for password, we basically can return some patterns that's kind of internal representation together with the co sample codes for this particular task. Um, here basically saying that you have the code object and you want to reach a uh, instruction object. And how we can do that? First, you invoke get code on this code object as an argument for this instruction list uh, constructor invocation. And you get this instruction list object. And finally, you invoke get instructions on this instruction list object. And then you get an array of instructions. So that's the solutions that uh, we can get from password to accomplish this task. As you may notice, I for return type, we have an unknown there. That's basically like uh, uh, showing the issues that we may have in dealing with these partial code examples. Although we use some uh, heuristic to try to get more, uh, more and more this kind of a type information, but we still face some situation we don't have the uh, known types for certain return type or argument type. But for this situation, it really like. Uh, doesn't affect our results because we only care about the ending one and the beginning one. We basically can use this uh, uh, corresponding code example to help us to adjust this task. And we also uh, carry out some comparison with existing tools. Uh, there are uh, two other related tools, and one is called uh, ProSpectre, developed at uh, UBC and Strux Corner. Oh, sorry, developed at uh, UC Berkeley. And the Strux Corner developed at UBC, British Columbia. And we basically like um, issue some queries from um, particular objects based on Eclipse graphic, graphical editor framework and see how well these existing tools um, can deal with uh, this kind of a task, and we also um, uh, use the Google code search as the last uh, comparison base for us. So basically, from the table, um, for the first column of the each category, it shows the number of the total examples uh, returned by each tool. And the second column shows the rank of the target sequence, the, the, the right sequence. And as you can see, like the password is doing very well in contrast to existing tools. Um, um, for the number of the tasks can be uh, successfully uh, achieved, we can see password can deal with 8 out of 10 of the queries that we put here. And Prospector can deal with 6 out of 10, and Strats Corner can deal with 5 out of 10. And for Google Code Search, if we use Google Code Search for these particular uh, queries, we can find out for some of the cases, we really need to browse many code examples in order to figure out the sequence that you want. Okay, so that shows that just relying on Code Search Engine without doing some mining or processing, it's really not sufficient enough to deal with this kind of particular programming task. Okay, thanks. Next, I will quickly uh, uh, discuss our two recent tools on using Google Code Search or, in general, Code Search Engine to find bugs in the code that, that you have written uh, for using some APIs. The motivation for our expert tool is that when you try to use certain APIs provided by frameworks or libraries, especially when you are dealing with some like resources uh, intensive applications like database uh, or networking, you, you really need to use certain APIs that can throw exceptions. 
for example, um, for the section a API, the section is uh, the class API of the Hibernate framework. It can show Hibernate exception. And in addition, there are some kind of a programming rules uh, which might not be uh, directly explicit in the document um, on this kind of a exceptional handling. For example, um, we may require you to the client application to roll back open and committed transaction after this hibernate exception occurs. Okay, but as a programmer, you may not remember to do this kind of a rollback after the exception is thrown. And during testing, it's very difficult to expose these kind of issues. Um, failing to obey this kind of programming rules in exception handling can cause a lot of troubles. Uh, for example, uh, if you, your transaction is no rollback, then your database log would then be released, and then that would cause uh, really uh, serious issues there. And it can also cause your performance issues. Uh, a recent study by Weymouth and uh, Nakura in 2005, they discovered that for a particular application, they, they tried to investigate. Um, it, after they improved the exception handling uh, of the application, they discovered the performance of the application can gain like 17% of the gain. Um, after they correctly handling the uh, exceptions. So that's kind of like another uh, benefit at, after you fix this kind of issue. I would just give you like very quick uh, overview of what kind of patterns we can gather up on the examples that we can, uh, we can uh, collect it from a cold search engine. So this is a one uh, Java example that we can collect from the web. Um, let's focus on these particular exceptions, like SQL exception. Um, based on this code example, we can construct some uh, control flow graph uh, with some um, solid lines on the graph as a normal execution path and the dotted lines as exceptional path. Uh, basically, it's like the path you would need to go through when you encounter a particular exception. Notice that uh, we use some program analysis to figure out like uh, for certain nodes, you don't need to have an exception pass to the exception handling block because we know, for example, for node six, for this particular set UI method call, you don't have the SQL exception being thrown. Then we can avoid like these false positives. And for the same code segment, we can recover this kind of a exception model, uh, which is used to de detect this kind of violation of the, the uh, model as the potential defects. So basically here what we are saying is that for node 9, which basically SQ updates, if you have this message invocation before this method call, and you may need to do these kind of things, right? You need to roll back, you need to close the statement, close connection, and, and close uh, Oracle data source. You need to do this, otherwise you might potentially have problems, okay? And after we discover these patterns, uh, then we can detect the violation, and there are some results. I'm not going to uh, go through the details, but basically we de detect some real defect from the open source application, and we reported like 12 defects uh, to HSQLDB, and then the developer confirmed like seven of them are real, and they, they will fix them. Um, I'm not going to go through the neg web, which is kind of helping us to detect negative conditions. Basically, you forget about uh, checking certain conditions, uh, uh, checking some argument on return values, and we can discover this pattern to help us detect the defects. So in conclusion, um, searching is very powerful nowadays with uh, this kind of existing powerful search engine. Uh, but we feel that it's very important for us to step, have one more step ahead, like to help us to use the results, the code example returned by this code search engine to help us to uh, address like code reuse or defect detection. And mining is one promising direction to help us to discover the common patterns among these code examples. I might take some questions. Yeah, Nim. Thanks. Any questions?
questions? So uh, I guess you didn't get to discuss much of related work here, but it has been all that work on using the types to find uh, to find code sequences like this. So uh, uh, what do you mean, like oh, you you mean the prospector? Sorry, well I don't know the name of the project, but there was work from Rust Body. There was work also in the functional programming languages community and so on. Right. So how you know orthogonal is that to this thing, or would it be possible to somehow combine this and that to to in more precise answers or something like that. I mean, I understand this is a completely different approach, but in some sense, it's solving the same problem, right? Given this type, given that type, find a sequence to get from here to there. Right. So, uh, indeed, like, for the later parts, for mining parts, uh, there might be existing techniques kind of similar or can be used in our context. I think the, the, the challenge of our context, as I mentioned, the partial code and how you can uh, issue a uh, special kind of a query to help you to deal with this kind of a uh, situation. Indeed, like when you had the code examples at hand, you can use many existing techniques to deal with those uh, either mining or defect detection. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Thank you.